reading this morning is found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Okay, great. Good morning. It's good to see you all. And uh, uh, what a week to be talking about anxiety. Uh, I don't know if you've been following uh, the elections and uh, the results are out and maybe you're thinking the nightmare is finally over. Uh, or maybe you're thinking, oh no, the nightmare is finally be is, is now beginning. And I don't know, or maybe you're completely indifferent to the whole thing, but uh, the US election results are out and uh, Christ is still on his throne. So we have a good reason for peace. Uh, but the question we wanna ask today is, is, uh, is how do you find peace that passes all understanding uh, in a crisis that passes all understanding? Uh, because here we are in this pandemic in this long scenario in which we don't know what's gonna happen. It's unpredictable. Uh, and it, it, in some ways it defies understanding. And Paul here is prescribing for us uh, uh, or proclaiming for us a peace that passes all understanding. And that's the question we want to ask today. And there's a lot of instructions that Paul gives in this passage, but I want to focus on three that really serve as antidotes to anxiety. Uh, and there are three things that we're going to uh, see that, that, uh, that provide us with uh, a lasting peace that passes all understanding, even in a pandemic that passes all understanding. Uh, and the three things we're going to see are the work of joy, uh, the work of prayer, and the work of peace. The work of joy, the work of prayer, and the work of peace. So first of all, uh, the work of joy. When you think about joy, look at what Paul says. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. But look at that first verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, it's very important to remember Paul is in prison. He's, uh, he's, he's not facing an uncertainty of uh, what's going to happen next uh, in a sense that in a way that we are. His uncertainty that he's facing is the face is he's first of all in, uh, in prison facing possible death in, by execution. Uh, there's, this is not a democracy. This is a monarchy. Uh, and it's a monarchy in which everything is justified. And here he is in this situation. And from prison, he's writing to Christians, encouraging them to be joyful always. And I want to find, kind of point out uh, that he's, uh, he's calling for us to do the work of finding joy in the Lord. You know, so there's a, there's a if you think about joy, first of all, uh, joy is the transcendent feeling that you have when you get what you want. You know, that, that's, a, that's, it's a transcendent feeling that you have when you get what you want. And uh, it's very deeply related to our desires. And what Paul is prescribing for us is to rejoice in the things that we have be, been given in Christ Jesus. That's where we find joy, but it's, it's, it's work to do that. You know, so uh, it, because this is actually, he's actually assuming that this is a choice that you can make. And for us to reconcile what is joy a feeling or is it a choice? It's, 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 uh, you've got to put it this way. It is, it is a choice that we make repeatedly until we have trained ourselves to experience the feeling always. Joy is a choice that we make constantly. So we train ourselves to experience joy as a feeling always. Uh, and, and I think that the tension today in the 21st century, particularly in a city like Delhi, is that uh, we, are, we, we feel that joy is unattainable. It's desirable. It's just, we, we all want joy. We all want to feel joy always. It, it's desirable, but it seems unattainable. And what we do instead is we, we settle for pleasure. We settle for pleasure. 
And now joy and pleasure are kind of synonymous. So I want to kind of distinguish what I mean by joy and pleasure. When Paul is saying rejoice in the Lord, the contrast is that we can settle for pleasure that comes from the world. See, and joy is something that delights the heart. It's deep and it's lasting and it delights the heart. It, it, the heart feels good. But the pleasure that comes from the world is pleasure that satisfies the body. It's physical. It makes us feel better. And these pleasures are everywhere. And I, and I want you to know the, the world is in many ways powerless to give us joy. But it is incredibly potent in providing us with pleasures that are in the world. And we are settling for pleasures in the world because joy seems so unattainable. Because it is work to get joy. It doesn't come easy. You, you, there's, a, there's a hard work that's involved in it. And the thing is, all pleasure because I, I don't want to be anti-pleasure. I don't want to sound like that. I mean, if, you, if you've heard from me before, you know my temptation to ice cream and all of the earthly pleasures of sugar. But uh, no, all pleasure uh, has the capacity to point us to God. But no earthly pleasure has the capacity to replace God. And I think that's the tension that we are feeling in the age that we live in. We want joy, but we've settled for pleasure. Because pleasure is easy, it's instant, it's accessible, and it makes us feel better. But the trouble is, it's like this, it's like if you go to H&M today, uh, you, you'll see this advertisement they have, buy now, pay later. And that's what pleasure is. It's just, you, you get it now, but you actually pay for it later, and the price tag is heavy. And the, the, we, the, we, when we feel anxious, we seek these pleasures, they make us feel better, but actually in the long run, they make us more restless more anxious, more guilty, and more ashamed, not less. So there's a deceit that's interwoven in this, uh, in, in this, in this uh, instant gratification culture that we live in, where if, I if I'm feeling anxious, if I'm feeling uh, troubled, I just need to feel better. And I get easy access in the world provides you with plenty of options for this. And a couple of uh, uh, months ago, I was in a webinar with a, uh, with, a, with a pastor and a thinker. And one of the questions asked of him was, you know, is there anything that God wants us to learn in this pandemic? What do you think God wants us to learn in this pandemic? And one of the things he said is that, you know, there was a virus before the virus. And the virus was that we'll be happy if we get what we want. There was this deceitful lie in our hearts that told us our greatest freedom will come when we're able to do what we want and we're able to get what we want. And it goes back all the way to Eden, to the Garden of Eden, where there's the temptation, where the, the tempter puts the thought, plants the thought in the mind of Eve and Adam. Did God really say that? Did God really say that? That's the first virus. Did God really say that? And the second virus he plants in the mind is you will not surely, you will not surely die. Nothing's going to happen to you. There's going to be no cost to this. You can do what you want. And the temptation was to be like God. And he says, and, and for, for, for me, as, as, a, as, as, a, as a, I think my greatest fear for not just uh, our church, but for the city is that even a, a pandemic, uh, we may find a vaccine for this pandemic. We may find that. We may find a cure for, for COVID-19 and all that. But this, even a pandemic like this may not cure us of that virus. That virus of self, self autonomy, that independence, and that desire to uh, heal ourselves by seeking pleasures that temporarily satisfy, and not doing the work of joy that provides this deep, lasting antidote to anxiety, which is what we all want. Now, uh, and and pleasure at the, at the heart of it is an escape from reality. It's 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 an unwilling to face reality, and that joy is a contrast, and that's why it's the work of joy. Because if you think about joy, and I mean, if, if, you, if you're in Redeemer, you know, a few months ago, we did a series on lamentations. And you've got to ask, well, what is, how does lamentations relate to this joy? How do you get there? And, and it comes from the simple fact that joy comes from facing reality, not escaping reality. Pleasure comes from escaping reality. But joy comes from facing reality. And that's why we don't want to do it. We don't want to do that work. We don't want to face reality. And it comes from, it, joy comes from looking straight at your sins, at your sorrows, at your secrets, at your struggles, at all your sighing, and at all of the uh, stories, that, uh, the parts of our stories that are broken and shattered and unresolved. 
we, you know, whenever those things come up, we seek pleasure to escape them. But joy says, no, no, look at it. Look at it first. Face reality. And then joy will come. And it, it and if you think about, uh, uh, if you think about uh, joy as, as, a, as a, it's a habit, it's a habit of looking at our sins and not being, uh, uh, looking at all of these our sins, our secrets, our struggles, our sighing, our sorrows, uh, and all of the broken parts of our stories. And, and Paul says, you know, uh, later on, he, in the next verse, he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And, I, and what, I, what, what you want to say about that is that what we choose, that what we choose will be known to everyone. You know, when we choose joy, when we choose joy, our, our gentleness, our reasonableness will be evident to all. And when we choose pleasure, when we choose these lesser uh, options, our restlessness will be evident to all. Whatever we choose will be evident to all. It'll be known to all. It, it's going to be obvious. It kind of, it kind of sticks out, you know. And uh, and part of the uh, the uh, the power for our gentleness being known to everyone is this confidence that the Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. And the the more confident we are about that, the more gentle our uh, more our gentleness will be evident to all. And the more uh, anxious we are, the more uh, or rather the more. Uh, the less confident we are that God is near, the less aware we are that God is near, the more our restlessness will be known to everyone. And this is this is an incredibly vulnerable thing, right? Because if you think about it, uh, it's it's it, you, the question we want you, I want to ask is what about you is known to everyone? You know, is it your gentleness from the confidence that God is at hand, or is it your restlessness from the feeling that God is far away? And this is not something we're in control of, but right? this is this is not something we get to testify about ourselves. Others can see it, so it's kind of vulnerable. And the person, uh, and and so our, our, in in this sense, our experience, our state of being, is not something to which we testify. It's it's something that we must listen to what people are seeing about us. You know, and you know, the person who knows me most is my wife, and particularly over the last uh, eight months, because we've been cooped up in a in this flat together. So we've seen each other, and she's seen me. And just a few weeks ago, she was telling me, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't seem very joyful. You, you you don't seem very joyful. And here I am thinking, uh, and I, I was instantly offended. You know, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm always joyful. <laughs> So and uh, but 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 and I shared a couple of weeks ago that that uh, this past season has been a bit strange for me. Past couple of this particular month, and uh, and that's important for you to know. I mean, just be, being a pastor doesn't mean that you're immune to the pandemic. Doesn't mean that you're immune to the stresses and the anxieties and the weight and the uh, uncertainty and all of that. It doesn't. Uh, you're not immune to that, but. But she was able to see that. She was able to see the restlessness because I'm, I, I clearly I was living in a state where I wasn't aware that God is at hand, and seeking pleasure in all kinds of uh, alternative comforts. And so she's she's sensing that you're not being joyful. And and I realized this. So so one of the things I decided that I'm going to do is to take some time every week and just uh, sit with a notepad and a pen and start to face the reality. Because if you if you think about if I think about my own heart, I feel like my heart is like this house with uh, many rooms and some of the doors to the rooms are locked and nobody's allowed to go in there. I don't want to go in there. The, the, the rooms are there, the, the stuff inside uh, and, I, and I'm living in denial of it. So I'm happy to live in the other occupied, uh, the other rooms of the house, but we don't want to go to those rooms. And I felt in this time, God was saying, you need to open that door. You need to go to these rooms. And, and I'll be with you. I'll go with you into these rooms, but you need to go to these rooms. So I uh, decided to do one last bid with retail therapy. I went on Amazon. I bought a brand new Parker pen. I brought a, bought a brand new notebook. And I decided I'm going to sit in front of my table and I'm going to uh, let my heart speak to me. So I'm going to just sit down and uh, I, I kind of put... Uh, put different pages and different chapters in my life. So the first was the, just because I, there was a lot going on in my heart. And the work I did was essentially to uh, put down on a piece of paper in no chronological order, any memory that came to mind. 
I was just going to sit and listen to what is my heart saying to me, any memory that came to mind, anything from my past, anything that was hurtful, anything that was joyful, anything that was anything that that is 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 for some reason uh, in my mind. And I'm going to put it down on a piece of paper. And the, the heart is a funny thing. Right? It doesn't think chronologically. So I've got memories coming to me from when I was five years old. I've got memories coming to me from when I was in my 20s. I've got all these memories and I'm just documenting them down and putting them down and just allowing my heart to speak to me there's no there's no uh you know there's no paragraphs or sentences it's just sometimes it's words sometimes it's something what somebody said to me sometimes it's just an image uh and and a flash of mind but I'm, i just want to pay attention and open the doors that have been locked for so long and uh, if you know physically in a room when you open a door as after it's been locked for a long time there's a smell right? it's disorienting it's not easy. And that's why you, it's not something I can do every day. It's something I have to do once a week over a period of time. And, uh, and one thing, uh, and this started to, uh, this is hard work. So it, it, it's not at all uh, easy to do. But one thing that started to happen is I would take a memory and I would start to meditate on it with Jesus in mind. And I would start to think about, and I, because now I've, I've got enough distance from my past where I can now see that memory and I can start to think about uh, uh, how the, uh, start to think, start to look at it through Jesus's eyes, start to look at it through his perspective and start. And w- what began to happen is I started to feel joy. I started to feel that God is with me now and he was with me then and he's brought me from there to here and he's going to continue to lead me. And there were, and there's all these, and sometimes it's fragments of memory. They just reminded me that God is with me. And his nearness became real to me, and it, it, this is, and it, that's why joy is is a is a is a discipline. But once it becomes a discipline, the reward of it is the feeling. Is the feeling of joy, and we can train ourselves to be joyful. But it is work that we must do. It is the work of joy. It is not uh, natural to us. It, it it it's resisting everything in us that wants to seek pleasure and and shortcuts and substitutes and anything any kind of coping mechanism or uh, self medicating strategy. But joy is is work. And as as we do the work of facing reality, uh, we can experience the nearness of God and, and joy can become the feeling uh, that we can have as we uh, rejoice in the Lord. But the second thing. Uh, Paul points us to as an antidote to anxiety is the work of prayer is the work of prayer and look at what Paul says he says do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God I've got some neighbors who are singing I don't know what they're doing so apologize but uh, but here is uh, Paul saying uh, First of all, he's inviting us to a life of gratitude uh, and a uh, life of, and a trusting life of prayer. Now, I, I I just turned forty this year, and forty I don't, I don't it maybe have a psychological difference, but uh, I feel different as a forty year old. I feel I just feel like okay, now I'm an adult. I'm not, eighteen doesn't make an adult in India. Only forty makes an adult in India. So I'm I'm forty years old, and I look back now and I think about. Uh, all the prayers that I prayed when I was in the in my uh, teenage years, in my twenties, even in my thirties, and I think about all the and I think about what's actually happened in my life, what's actually turned out to be true in my life, all the things I desired, all the things I wanted, uh, what what I got, what I didn't get, uh, what prayers were answered, what prayers were not answered, and there's a benefit that comes from hindsight at this age, you know, because uh, you realize now, uh, seeing what I see now, knowing what I know now. I can understand why God answered some prayers and didn't answer others. I can, I can see that, you know, and I can, uh, and, 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 and now maybe as a, it was, it's a little easier because when I was praying, even in those times, I tried to make it as easy for God as possible. So I would have a pattern for prayer. I, I, I would, first of all, be very open and honest about what I wanted from God. But then I would always have this qualifier. I would always say it has to be in your time. It has to be in your way. And it has to be to your pleasure. It has to be something that delights you. It has to be something that you enjoy and that you want me to have. And uh, so in that way, I was kind of making it a little bit easy for God and even for myself. Uh, and 
and one thing i've realized uh, as uh, tim keller has a quote where he he describes this he says uh, he says the of of prayer he says my uh, he says whenever a child this is uh, he says it as if god is saying this he says whenever a child of mine asks for anything i will always give that person what they would have asked for if they knew everything i know whenever a child of mine asks for something i will always give them what they uh, i will always give that person what they would have asked for if they know what i know and that's and to the degree that you know that to the degree that you believe that you will have peace you will have peace and if you don't have peace there's a chance that you don't really believe that and the question you have to ask is why not why do we trust ourselves so much and why do we trust him so little when if he knows uh, if we knew what he knows if we can see what he sees if we uh, enter uh, and uh, if we knew that we uh, we would ask for things differently that's the confidence that we uh, must go with in prayer that god is someone uh, who knows who can see what we can't see who can uh, who knows what we don't know and who can do what we can't do but in prayer paul presents us with these uh, with this attitude of gratitude right and gratitude in uh, is this antidote to anxiety and what's fascinating to me is that uh, throughout scripture right whenever you see a command whenever you see an instruction it's always incredible to me to find out how uh, the the these commands are validated in the world because today you've got research uh, done by this man called robert emmons that uh, shows that gratitude is biologically an uh, antidote to anxiety uh, thank, and and this is not uh, this doesn't include uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 depression or anxiety disorders but in the general everyday living of anxiety gratitude is actually an antidote to anxiety and he says in a in a talk he says this you know he he kind of qualifies he says i'm going to say something that's going to sound so astounding to you but i want you to know all of the research and all of the work we've done justifies it and here's what he says he says gratitude has a power to do three things it has the power to heal it has the power to energize and it has the power to change lives that's what he says from all his research he says gratitude has the power to heal to energize uh, and to change lives and he says uh, it can he- people have reported that gratitude has healed them of past hurts it's changed their perspective from uh, not focusing on what they're deprived of but rather focusing on what they already have it's changed their perspective uh grat- and there's two things he talks about that gratitude is uh the first thing that gratitude is gratitude is an affirmation of goodness it is an affirmation of goodness that despite everything that's happening here are these things that are good there are there are there are there are blessings that i that are that i possess that i have and there's it's an affirmation of the goodness uh, in life and uh, because anxiety will blind your mind of the idea that there's anything good in life because you're f- focused on all that's going wrong but gratitude is a determined affirmation of goodness and the second thing he says that uh, gratitude is gratitude is an attribution it's an attribution it's giving credit where credit is due it's recognizing the sources of these goodness now that source might be a person it might be a person who's done something for you or, or, or who is away with you their their presence is meaningful to you and you want to thank them there is an it is an attribution of uh, i'm grateful for you but the attribution could also be to god and this is a secular researcher saying this that if you're a spiritual person you have an advantage because you have attribution to a higher power and for us how uh, revealing that god says in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to god in the context of not being anxious you know gratitude is the is an antidote to our anxiety and he talks about how there's a difference between short term feeling grateful it's just or or just uh, saying thank you when something happens or something like that and there's a that's your uh, basic uh, gratitude but there's a difference between having that habit and being a grateful person having a grateful heart there's a whole difference between the two and he says uh, the grateful person has a deep abiding thankfulness as an orientation of the soul 
there's a deep abiding thankfulness as an orientation of the soul. The grateful person is able to receive what others are providing as a gift. And here's the, uh, the two things that are important. Grateful person accepts all of life, good and bad, as a gift. The grateful person, person accepts all of life, good and bad, as a gift. Uh, and uh, so there's a difference between life as a gift and life as a burden, because that's what anxiety makes you feel like. Anxiety makes you feel like life is a burden. It is a curse to be endured. It is a punishment to be suffered. It is not a gift to be received. But gratitude positions us as a, to live life as a, as a gift. And uh, there's a distinction between satisfaction and deprivation. Uh, the pe great people who are grateful, they see uh, they're, they're, they're focused on, or let's, let's begin with people who are anxious are focused on a, have, people who are anxious have a deprivation mindset. They have a deprivation mindset. They're focused on what is what life is denying them. They're focused on what they're losing out on. They have a lens of scarcity. But the grateful person is as a satisfaction mindset. What, and they're focused on what life is offering, what they're enjoying, and they see life through a lens of abundance. And listen, if, if you're on a Zoom call on a Sunday morning uh, in the comfort of your home, whatever is going on, you have much to be grateful for. Much to be grateful for. And if you don't know that, your, your mind is skewed. Anxiety has blinded you. It has blinded you. And, and, the, and gratitude is, is so important for us uh, as an antidote to anxiety. And here's the thing about anxiety that's very important for us to know. Because it's because our, our thinking and our loving are interwoven. Our thinking and our loving are interwoven. So if you love anything, you're vulnerable to being anxious about it. If you love anything, you're vulnerable to be anxious about it. If you love your family, you're vulnerable to be anxious about what happens to them. If you love your children, you're vulnerable to be anxious about what happens to them. If you, if you, uh, if you love the idea of family, you're gonna be anxious about, well, I don't have a family yet. And when you have a family, you'll be anxious about what happens to them. See, it doesn't matter whether you have it or you don't have it. If you love something, it's going to, you're vulnerable to anxiety. If you love your job, if you, if you love the idea of work, you're going to be anxious if you don't have a job. And then if you have a job, you'll be anxious about how you're doing at the job and whether you're going to keep the job. If you, uh, whatever you love, uh, you're going to be anxious about. If you love the idea of romance and being with someone, you're going to be anxious because you haven't met anyone yet. And if you meet someone, you're going to be anxious about how this relationship is going. Where is it going? What's going to happen next? Is it going to last? Is it not going to last? Am I good enough? Am I not good enough? So whatever you love, you're going to be anxious about it. So now the cure that culture typically offers us for this relationship between love and anxiety, this relationship between our thinking and our loving is be detached. Don't set your expectations too high. You know, just stay cool. You know, keep your, just, just, uh, 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 it's like George Clooney in that movie Up in the Air. You know, he's, he's got this training program where he basically puts a backpack on the, on the table and says, you have to travel light because life is uh, complicated and you've got to travel light, keep your expectations low and you won't get hurt. And that's, that's typically the, the, the option that we're given. But uh, in, in the Christian story, that's not the resolution to our relationship between thinking and loving. Uh, because the thing with all of these things that we love uh, that, make us, that, that make us vulnerable to anxiety is that we're not in control of any of them. That's the root of it. We're not in control of any of them. So for our hearts to enjoy peace, for our hearts to enjoy rest, our supreme love, our first love must be something that doesn't need us to be in control of it. It must be something that's immutable. It must be something that can't be taken away. It must be something that can't change. It must be something that cannot be uh, removed from us or separated from us. It must be something that we cannot be separated from. And if that is our first love, our supreme love, then, it, 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 uh, then we don't need to be in control of it. Now, as a Christian, can you imagine what that love, what that first thing could be? What does a Christian have that can never be taken away? What does a Christian have that uh, doesn't need us to be in control of it? 
what does a Christian have that it can never be separated from? What does a Christian have that is immutable, unchangeable, immune to our uh, obedience or disobedience, constantly faithful, if not the love of God? And if our hearts are set on him, if he's our first love, our supreme love, our, our great love, then peace is a natural outcome. And gratitude is a natural outcome. But if you're experiencing anxiety, if you're experiencing any kind of stress, it's probably because some other love has taken its place that needs you to be in control. That's the, that's the, and the antidote to anxiety is to, is to move to that. And, you know, one of the sad things, one of the things I, I, I uh, encountered this week is uh, uh, I follow this writer named Tim Challies and he's a blogger and he, he writes a lot, uh, a very, very good writer. And uh, uh, he shared, uh, uh, he posted a tweet or uh, some, some, something on his blog. And here's what, here's what he said. And uh, it's a heartbreaking thing. Uh, but here's what he says in all the years I've been writing I have never had to type words more difficult more devastating than these yesterday the Lord called my son to himself my dear son my sweet son my kind son my godly son my only son it's a heartbreaking tweet uh, his, his son was uh, in in his in in the university playing a game with his sister and his fiance and some other friends and and he just dropped and collapsed right on the spot. Paramedics came, they tried to revive him, they tried to resuscitate him, uh, but he was gone just like that. And and here's Tim Challies uh, just in in a state where experiencing what uh, any parent knows is probably the worst nightmare that you can possibly face, without any warning without any chance to say goodbye. Just like that, gone. All those memories, all of that, that lifetime, 20 years of knowing a child, and only a parent to some degree can understand what this means. I mean, I've known Mia for two years, but imagine multiplying by that, that by 10. It's extraordinary. And, and what happens next is that uh, Tim, Challies, uh, uh, his, Tim Challies is in Canada, the, his son is in the US, so now you've got the pandemic situation where you've got to cross borders, you've got to have a socially distant memorial service, you've got to have all of these restrictions on uh, how, to, how to grieve, how to mourn. And here's Tim Challies finds his way to the college and at the college he says this, he says uh, about his son Nick, he says, Nick loved Boyce College and the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, I don't know how he felt about the property, I don't know how he felt about the facilities. I don't know how he felt about the institution, but I know how he felt about the people. I know how much he loved the students, how much he loved the faculty, how much he loved the staff, how much he loved the administration. I know how much he loved you, and I know how much he was loved by you. So thank you for being his teachers, his mentors, his supporters, his friends, his family when he was in America. He ran only a short race, just 20 years, but he finished strong. And I'm so thankful that he was able to finish his race with you, surrounded by the people he loved. How you think about this? I mean, do you think Tim Challies and his family is heartbroken? Yes. But do you, but do you think Tim Challies and his uh, family are grateful? Yes. And do they have joy? And, do, and the big question to ask here is, do you think they have more of Christ right now or less? They probably have more of him. His love is sweeter to him. His love is uh, deeper to them. And now let's say I, I, I stopped the sermon there. I said, okay, I've given you two things to do. You've got the work of joy and you've got the work of prayer. Now go do it. Go, go do the work of joy, go do the work of and you won't be anxious anymore. Uh, I don't know how long you would last. But because the, the next thing that we are told is the work of peace. And this is not the work that we do. And the only reason we can do the work of joy and the work of uh, prayer is because of the work of peace that God has done. This is the work that he says only he can do. And he has done. And that's why we can do the work of joy and the work of prayer.
and the work of peace is this and the peace of god which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus finally whatever finally brothers whatever is true whatever is honorable whatever is just whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is commendable if anything if there's any excellence if there's anything worthy of praise think about these things and what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things and the god of peace will be with you and there's two things to to think about here the peace of god that keeps us and the god of peace who is with us the peace of god that keeps us the peace of god that does the work of guarding our hearts and minds in christ jesus and the god of peace who is with us uh you know the peace of god is the antidote to the anxiety over god's relationship to us because typically in a country like india when bad things happen uh, you're asking yourself one of two questions you know uh, uh, i i the first question or the first thing is i must have done something to deserve this i must have done something to deserve this and if you if you feel more justified in your heart more more secure in your obedience to god you might ask what have i done to deserve this i've been faithful what have i done to deserve this? but the peace of god is an antidote to all of those things and we have to face the reality that the truth is that we are deserving of all the bad things that you could possibly imagine we are not innocent and we have to face that reality but the good news and the and uh, is that god who has the right to do bad things to us who has the right who has, who has no responsibility to protect us from bad things because we've rebelled against him but he himself has chosen to make peace with us he has chosen to relate to his enemies and turn them into his allies and turn them into his friends turn them into his family and this peace of god is uh, that god has chosen to offer uh, or the, the this this gospel is that god has chosen to offer terms of peace to his enemies he has chosen to do that and he has chosen to do it uh, at the cross and at the cross uh, god himself looked at his own son and said my dear son my sweet son my kind son my godly son my only son he was able to say that about jesus he did that willingly and he says about him and and he treated his son like an enemy so that are we who are his enemies can be at peace with him so that there is a, an established peace between god and human beings that's been offered to us and in christ jesus we have it and is this 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 is the peace that passes all understanding this this how can god provide this peace to his enemies at the cost of his own dear son and the deeper you know that the deeper you think about that and that's where all of this uh, this instruction of paul is whatever is true whatever is honorable whatever is just he's essentially whenever paul uh, says particularly the word truth he's talking us he's telling us to think about the doctrine of jesus think about what he's done and the more you think about that the more you are assured in your heart that i am at peace with god god is not an enemy to me and i have been made a friend to god and that guards our my our hearts and minds in christ jesus it shields us and it reminds us uh, that god is for us not against us but well, the second thing is the is the is the god of peace who is with us you know often we think of peace as the absence of something it's the absence of conflict it's the absence of chaos it's the absence of disorder uh, but in in scriptures peace is the presence of someone it's someone who is with us it's someone who is uh, present to us and he so so god is not only the the person who has brought the peace of god to us through christ jesus he is also the god of peace who is with us uh there's a true story of uh, joseph scriven he is a irishman who uh, moved to canada in the 19th century mid 19th century and he he uh, he lost his wife uh, the day before their wedding he was kind of going to see go, going to the towards the home and he saw her body uh, uh, floating uh, uh, kind of under the water near a creek she had fallen off a horse fell into the water and drowned and this is the day before their wedding and uh, he was devastated and he uh, and a few years later uh, a few yeah a few years later uh, the same devastation happened to him so a few this time a few weeks before his wedding uh, the person he was going to get married to fell sick and eventually died and so this is this has happened to him twice now 
and you would think that a person who's uh, feeling who's been through this must think that god has become an enemy to them he's treating them he's punishing them but here he is he's uh, he he doesn't feel that god is punishing him instead he finds a deep friendship with god and he writes a poem that he wanted to he, that he initially wrote uh, as a comfort to his mother so he writes the poem and sends it to his mother and it was originally called uh, praying without ceasing and he he describes to his mother how through these two tragedies god has become more real to him and the friendship that he has with god has deepened through this crisis and it and he's found this peace that passes all understanding and later on many years later that poem was turned into a hymn and that him we all know we all know now is what a friend we have in jesus that's the story and i'm going to just read out a couple of uh, verses from that him and this is this is something he wrote after uh, devastation uh, feeling that he is he's not an enemy of god but he's uh, he's he's is at peace with god and that peace of god has been proven in a friendship that he's had so here's what he says he says what a friend we have in jesus all our sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry everything to god in prayer oh what peace we often forfeit oh what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to god in prayer have we trials and temptations is there trouble anywhere we should never be discouraged take it to the lord in prayer can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share jesus knows our every weakness take it to the lord in prayer are we weak and heavy laden cumbered with a load of care precious savior still our refuge take it to the lord in prayer do thy friends despise forsake thee take it to the lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and shield thee that will find a solace there we are enemies who have been brought into peace with god he has made peace with us and by the extravagant love of god and he is the god of peace who is with us and he will keep us to the end and my prayer is that that confidence in the work that god has done for us this peace of god will will become so real to our hearts that we'll do the work of joy we'll do the work of prayer and we'll enjoy the benefit of being at peace with god